tell all my friends they better be coming. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Hummingbird Hour. I will let the uh, the interwebs do their their magic here and uh, watch everyone uh, join us in uh, in the the viewing community. I think it's officially called the attendee group. Uh, so we're we're so excited that all of you are joining us uh, today for this special event at Hummingbird Humanity. And happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is safe and well, and uh, that you're enjoying the um, the return to a new normal. I think there's going to be lots of conversations about what does life and what does life and work look like post uh, pandemic. Although the reality is that it's I, I I keep wanting to say post pandemic, but it's not post pandemic. The the pandemic is still very real, um, and uh, even in our in our country here, but certainly in some countries around the world that are still ravaged by the 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 COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So our hearts go out to them. Well, again, welcome to Hummingbird Hour. And uh, Hummingbird Hour is our weekly conversation series celebrating our one year anniversary at Hummingbird Humanity. It's still a bit surreal for me uh, to, uh, to realize that I launched a new business uh, at the height of the pandemic and we've survived and thrived um, and, um, and are um, most importantly for me uh, impacting hearts and minds and making a difference in the lives of others. Uh, I, um, when we launched Hummingbird um, Humanity last year, we started with a conversation series called Hope, Heart, and the Human Spirit, which um, I believe we need every day. And I certainly, our companies um, need Hope, Heart, and the Human Spirit every day as well. Um, but at the that time um, with, what was happening for all of us um, with the COVID-19. Um, it also just felt like we really needed it even more at that time. Uh, so I'm, um, I'm really excited that we're here today. And today is another big milestone for Hummingbird. Uh, we are releasing our first thought leadership paper, uh, uh, rep Representation Matters. Um, and we're gonna talk about what that, uh, what the, what's uh, in the paper. And we have um, some special guests with us here. Um, and I'll introduce everyone here in just a moment. Um, but I'm just so excited to be here today. Um, I would have never expected that this would be um, where, we where we would have landed a year after launching Hummingbird. Um, so let me introduce our guests and then I'm going to talk uh, just a bit about um, the, the why behind this paper and then I'm going to pass it over to, uh, to, the, to JD to, to lead us through. So our guests, um, we have Bianca Chow from Ericsson. Um, who and Bianca and I met when we worked both in the retail fashion space um, and uh, are I'm so delighted that we've stayed in touch and so glad you could be with us today Bianca and the incomparable Mita Malik, who I met through the Jennifer Brown uh, community calls, and we've become great friends and uh, LinkedIn fans of each other. Um, and uh, I'm so grateful, Mita, you've been such a great ally to me, and I'm, I'm so glad you could be here as well today. And last but not least, uh, J.D. Valladares Williams, who is the author of our paper and will be uh, guiding us uh, through the through the conversation today. So let's talk just a little bit about the, the why behind this paper. Um, and so some of you may be LinkedIn followers of mine. Again, I still it still can't believe I have followers on LinkedIn. That's a whole nother surreal moment. Um, but about three years ago, I started to say, um, as I was having conversations in-house um, and companies, um, and at the, the company I worked with at, worked at, at the time, um, about representation, what I kept hearing uh, in both my examples, but also the examples of others, that representation seemed to be very um, single-handedly focused on representation of the people that work at a company. And without question, representation and uh, people, the people that work in a company is important. But I also realized 
that representation is so much more than that. And, they're in, and the concept of how do humans see themselves in the ecosystem of every company um, is, is something that I felt like we were missing. And so I wanted to start to reframe representation um, and to think about how do we um, help companies and organizations start to think about representation in a number of different lenses uh, so that um, people like you know myself as a gay man can say, okay, I see this company is representing me in some way, shape or form in these various aspects of what they do every day. So that's really the, the vision behind this and we're, we're gonna share lots lots more, but that's that was where it all started. And, uh, and, and for those of you who do follow, thank you for following, thank you for liking. Um, and uh, I'm glad that I've been able to to create something that is adding value. Um, hopefully just, if it's just for you as an individual, um, for you, maybe you've seen a story that has impacted you personally, that's what it's all about. Um, and if it's also helped you to bring something to your company and organization, then that's fantastic as well. We, uh, we, wanna, we wanna impact hearts and minds and, and make workplaces that are welcoming for everyone. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to JD. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining today. Um, I'm super excited about this because it, it was really an opportunity that Brian gave me to take leadership of this paper and really take it to something that is maybe not what we normally see with thought leadership papers, which is that we've tried to make it really animated try to make it really diverse as far as the identities that we're covering. And also we've added all of the links to the resources of where we found all this information. I know that usually we just put it at the bottom and people have to do their own research. No, we want to make this as interactive as possible. And we hope that this holistic approach that we're trying to take to diversity and inclusion in the workplace gives you a few ideas of what companies are doing out there and also the rewards that are there both for the humans that work at your company and in your community, as well as business. Because at the end, of course, we want to make everything great for business, but it's also just really great for all of the humans involved in your company. So um, we'll share some stats about what current representation looks like and also what the future holds and how we want to plan for that future, how we want to evolve with the world as it's changing. And these are some of the characters that you'll see in the paper that are actual real humans that work in the field and have shared their expertise on how to improve the place for everyone to really feel like they want to come into work every day because we spend so much time at work that we really want to be somewhere where we're celebrated and are just happy to come in every day and do the best we can. So let's start by sharing um, some stats about what representation looks like in a few spaces. So when I looked at the percentage of full-time post-secondary um, school professors, I found that only 4% of them are black and 3% of them are Hispanic. So if we think about all of the colleges and universities that are out there, that seems like a really low percentage if we see the population as a whole. Four in 10 LGBT folks think that being out will impact their job search. So even when they're applying to new places, they are hiding that part of their identity because they still see that it can be used against them. 49% of respondents have said that organizations are not helping all their workers as technologies advance um, and things in the workplace change. So based on these three different identities that I've given you, I want to also show you what the future looks like because this is something that we need to tackle. So by 2050, half of the US population will be made up of people of color. So if we think back to that number of 
only uh, 4% black professors and 3% Hispanic professors to teach half of the US population. There seems to be a uh, disconnect there. One in five Gen Z identify as LGBT at the moment. So if four out of 10 people don't feel safe being themselves at work, and one in five of Gen Z, the next generation that's coming into the workplace identifies as LGBT, we need to do something about that. We need to change that environment if we want to attract that talent. And lastly, 65 to 74% um, the year old age group is expected to rise by 4.2% and the 75% group 6.7 annually. So this is a problem that we really need to take care of because they are also a part of our working force, a part of our community. And if they are going to be a larger part of our community, then we need to change the way that we're viewing our workplaces so that we're also including them and attracting all of the best talents to your organization. So the way that we've thought about this is, again, from a holistic approach. So we want to think about four lenses um, to view this in the workspace. First, people. And I know this one is the one that we usually talk about the most. Like, how do we attract talent? Um, what's the hiring process? How do we retain that diverse talent? What does career and succession planning look like? Especially accelerated programs so that those underrepresented groups get to the top quicker, um, as well as just building diverse leadership pipelines for the future so that this model becomes sustainable. When it comes to culture, creating an, an engaging and global place for all employees, um, that means being intentionally an, in, um, an inclusive culture where everyone can thrive. Uh, benefiting benefits meeting the needs of all underrepresented experiences. So for example, something that we've seen evolve over time is the addition of LGBT health, LGBTQ healthcare in the workplace, um, covering trans and gender nonconforming healthcare, celebrating differences. This is something that we've seen very recently that June Juneteenth became a federal holiday this year, even though the first the first celebration was in 1866. So if we think of how long we took to get to the place where companies are starting to celebrate Juneteenth, then um, we are seeing that there was a disconnect there, that maybe we're placing um, the celebration on some identities and lacking some representation for others. Customers. Customers are a huge part of your business, right? They are the ones that in the end are acquiring your products or your services. And so we want to target solutions for key customer segments, uh, diverse new products and services. Something that's really been in the forefront these days is um, adapt adaptive clothing, adaptive accessible websites, um, things that are really speaking to the disability, the people with disabilities community, which is one in four Americans. So if our products are not reaching one in four Americans, there's something that we need to do to change that. And lastly, community. If your company is taking up space in a locality, in a community, they have a responsibility to interact with that community, to give back to the community, and to also use that community as the talent pool pool line. And in order to do that, you need to create and invest that infrastructure for those people to succeed and end up at your companies. Also, volunteering and philanthropy. Um, these are things that companies, employees, customers are all asking for companies to take charge and really lead the change, especially because they see that governments are not always taking the initiative. So they are looking at other places and positions of power to create that change. So we're gonna cover all four of these and also include some anecdotes from our panelists on how 
some of these things that have been implemented at workplaces where they've been have really changed the way they can show up at work, the way they're empowered at work, the way they feel supported at work. And so I'd like to start with um, the people aspect of attracting, hiring, and developing talent. And I'd like to ask Bianca if she could share um, specifically um, the experience that she had in career succession planning with a woman who was getting close to retire and kind of wanted to see that diverse leadership pipeline continue and be sustainable. So could you tell us about your experience, Bianca? Sure, no, thank you for the question, JD. And again, thank you, Brian, for the opportunity to just share a little bit more of my story. Um, as Brian mentioned, I started my career in the fashion industry and I was lucky enough to do that through an executive training program. And the beauty of it was this, um, program was really ideated and kickstarted by a woman who was closer towards the end of her career. And so not only do I get this great example of a woman who's really thrived in retail and um, excelled when it comes to running a business, mentoring others, um, but I think the, the generational gap was really interesting. Sometimes as a young, naive person, you think I need to be mentored by someone uh, maybe one step above or two steps above um, or who is doing something really, really close to what I want to do. And the beauty of it was this one woman, she had sat in a bunch of different roles and um, specifically in the role that she was in, she was very generous, I would say, in coaching and providing, providing positive feedback, as well as constructive criticism. And I think that can be hard sometimes in corporate America. The myth is if you give constructive criticism, she might, she might, she might cry, right? Um, or maybe we're more open to giving that to a man than a woman. And at the end of the day, she wanted me to succeed. She wanted me to have access to opportunities. And so she um, had the courage to provide that coaching, but also to uh, maybe break some of the myths that I had thought about. I think because I'm a woman and also because I'm an Asian woman, some of the, the pitfalls that I fall into are I'm not the first to speak up um, or I don't wanna rock the boat, right? Um, I, I can sometimes fall into, um, we need to find a way to collaborate and to find a common ground. And so I think, after many, many years of being in the business world, she was willing to say, hey, if you think you're just going to put your head down and work hard and you'll get noticed, I'm here to tell you that sometimes you do need to raise your hand or you need to sign up for that project that's maybe a little bit messy. Um, and I think the other thing is she really taught me to lift as I rise. And so as I got more opportunities to work on projects, as I got more access to different leaders, she really modeled for me, how are you mentoring the next generation? And it doesn't have to be formal. Um, it can be um, advising someone on a project. It can be grabbing coffee. Uh, it can be ensuring that if there's a way that you can help out with the recruiting process at different schools, that you're a part of that. So there were, I would say, very um, nuanced um, ways that um, I didn't necessarily need to be a senior leader at the company to be a part of how it could be more inclusive. And it was modeled by someone who really valued inclusion and who was, um, I think, wanting to see her legacy um, left behind in terms of looking at diversity and attracting talent, recruiting talent, but then also retaining talent. I think that's something we talk a lot about. You can drive diversity through recruitment, hiring um, more talent that comes from different backgrounds, but we also really need to focus on retention. Um, and retention doesn't simply mean um, people who know how to do their roles and are committed to it, but people who feel like they have access to opportunity and growth. And I think that is the nuance of equity in terms of we're not just talking about equality, everybody getting the same treatment, but we're recognizing people have different starting points, they have different cultural backgrounds, which means they approach situations in different ways. And so sometimes what that might mean is different types of leadership development programs, knowing that we want more diversity at certain levels or in certain fields and looking at it through an equitable lens in terms of how do we determine fairness and 
an effort to get to our goal to have more representation through the lens of equity and and that and that changes and that's not just a formula that you find in a book that's really understanding your culture it's understanding your people um, and understanding potentially some of the biases that we have um, that we know about or maybe that we don't know about that keep people from access to opportunity and really growing and thriving into leadership roles. Thank you so much for sharing that experience, Bianca. And that actually is a great segue to the next lens, which is the one that focuses on culture and how we really create that space at work that celebrates differences and also acknowledges those identities that people hold. Um, because when people feel seen and valued at work, they're li likely to leave that space because it's really a place that's supportive and loving. Um, so I would ask now Mita if she could share um, an experience where she really felt seen and celebrated um, by her company and her peers, um, particularly when it comes to being a caregiver, uh, something that ha everyone has been struggling with, particularly during the pandemic. A lot of caregivers have, you know, are working full-time jobs babysitting and trying to handle all of these things with the pandemic on top. <laughs> so if, you, if Mita could share how um, your work has really shown up in that way to kind of help see your identity feel seen and supported. Yeah, thanks for the question, Bianca. I also related to a lot of what you said. Um, you know, caregiving is broad. When we think about caregiving, for me, I'll be particular about it. It's I'm a working mother. I have uh, Priya, who's six, going on 16. Jay, who's eight, going on 18. I have a demanding job. My partner has a demanding job, and uh, you know, it's been 15 months of being the chief entertainment officer, along with failing at remote school and failing at summer camp counselor, and that job that I'll be taking up again in the next few weeks. And so it's been really tough. I think I remember early on in the pandemic a leader saying, oh, well, this will all work itself out. You know, these kids at home, it'll all work itself out. And it's like, it doesn't work itself out because our villages and our communities have been ripped out from under us. And so all of the support system we had to help raise our children, raise all of our children disappeared. And as Brian said, there's some glimmers of hope of that coming up. I work at Carta, we're, in, we're a FinTech startup. We're also a global financial services company. And what's happening in India and in Rio and in Nepal and other parts of the world is devastating, right? So we sit here in the context of, you know, predominantly like a US, US focus, but just to acknowledge that that's happening still if you have a global workforce around the world. Uh, I will tell you the ways in which I have felt celebrated and supported. And I ask all of us to think about how we will support working parents as we return to the office, because there is a huge piece of separation anxiety our children will experience. I know my husband um, went back into New York City just for like a half day um, to gather some stuff in his office and see coworkers. And, and my six-year-old had like this really crazy, I shouldn't say crazy, really unexpected meltdown. Um, and she's six, even though we had prepared her, but we've all been around each other for so long. Like we've, it's just been the four of us as our frenemies, best friends, roommates, right? And so to acknowledge what that next transition will look like, the ways in which uh, companies and my company in particular have showed up for me is we've offered a very generous um, caregiver stipend during this time um, to help to help anyone who is in the care and helping care for someone else. The ways in which my coworkers have supported me have been small things like, you know, I've tried to cut back on drinking in this pandemic. So I don't send me a bottle of wine, but if you send me a piece of, you know, if you send me a pizza, I feel seen because that's like trying to work and trying to watch children and teach and having someone send me a meal unexpectedly is like, wow. I've had coworkers uh, jump on calls and like read to my children or just entertain them while I've been doing, you know, something. I had somebody send me the most amazing craft box and I almost like cried when I received it. It was just all these things to keep the kids occupied. And I had a former leader say to me, because of your experience as a working mother and what you've shared, I never, and the person's not a working parent or a caregiver, she ended up sending every parent on her team gifts for the kids 
versus just to get to know them and their ages versus, you know, yes, a good bottle of wine, fine, great, an Uber Eats card, fine, great. But just to take that extra step to meet people um, where they are, because no one knows the kind of grief, fear, anxiety that's going on behind people's screens. And so uh, I have a lot more thoughts, but I'll stop there. But I think it's just about getting, you know, as, as Brian reminds us, like uh, being human is hard being human is great and just meeting people and asking them like, where are you at? And like, how can I help you? So important. Thank you, Miriel, for sharing that story. And I love that then that person took that initiative to then get gifts for the team, but also get to know the kids a little bit better by knowing their ages, knowing a little bit of their stories, what they like to get those gifts. Um, it changes how people feel seen at work because you're like, oh, this company also cares about my family, cares about things that I care about, and that's important too. So now that we've spoken a little bit about people and culture and what you can do for your workforce, let's talk a little bit about what you can do for your customers and you know, we've seen companies um, increase representation in content. Uh, we've seen them come out uh, with products uh, focused on underrepresented groups. And something that Mita brought up during our conversation that really made me think in a broader sense was how do you interact with the rest of the people that also interact with your customers? So when it comes to the marketing agencies, the suppliers, those people in the room also being part of the decisions and the creation of those products that need to be present. So if you could uh, tell us a little bit about that and you know, something that you shared is that some companies feel like uh, we, we don't know how to reach these groups or these options are not out there and you've shown me that they are. <laughs> And so if you could explain uh, to the rest of the group, you know, some of your thoughts about it and some of the things they can do. Yeah, thanks for that question, JD. I don't think I have to convince anybody who's listening that inclusion is a driver of the business. I don't think I have to convince um, any of the 42 people who are listening right now. And the stats speak for themselves, you know, unfortunately or fortunately money talks over $1.3 trillion worth of spending power in the US alone with black African-American consumers. That's Nielsen, just one study. We know that over $3.1 trillion with the multicultural consumer of spending power, the LGBTQ plus community globally, over $3 trillion of spending power, individuals with disabilities. That are, so with intersectionality, there comes a huge opportunity to be serving authentically um, communities. And there's a huge business imperative. And I will tell you, if you're not thinking about this, I don't know how you'll be in business in the next 10 years. Look at JD, the stats you shared earlier about the demographics of the US changing. And so I, any company who says there's not growth out there, I would challenge you. I would challenge you to ask you who you're selling to and why. And so you look at these numbers and you think, gosh, like how can I do this? Like, what do I do? And one of the big things is bringing in thought leaders to the table, right? So like bringing in Brian and his team, right? Bringing in other um, agencies, partners, individuals who are really rooted in those communities and giving them a seat at the table and co-creating. Don't just give me the ad at the end and ask me for the racist check. Mita, is this racist? Like that, that has happened to me too many times in my career. And by that point, it's too late because the individual who has spent a lot of time on that content isn't likely to then receive my feedback very well to say, you know, I actually think there's a theme of colorism in what you've created because they've been working on it for months. But wow, if they had included me or others at the table from the start, I think that's so important. So don't be afraid to go out to communities and tell them what you want to do and bring them in from the start. And I think as we think about representation, which Brian brought up earlier, representation of a company, not everyone is where they need to be. We know that when it comes to uh, representation, particularly for underrepresented groups. I never want to be called into a client meeting because I am the only brown person available, right? That doesn't work. That's called tokenism. And if someone says to me, hey, Mita, I know you're really passionate about this work. I know um, you have a lot of expertise. 
And I'm going to be honest, the founder coming in is a brown woman. And so we'd love to staff you on this project if you're comfortable. I, I would be so excited to do it then rather than just showing up on the meeting. And I'm like, oh, now I know why I'm here. <laughs> you invited me because you needed me to be at the table. But I also think in the pandemic, we've all had to sort of let go of what our job description is, what we thought we were going to work on. And so I think it's an awesome opportunity for organizations to also flow work to where and flow people to the projects that matter and just setting it up appropriately. And so, and then the last piece I would say is like supplier diversity tied to who you bring to the table is so important. Having worked for so many large public companies over my career, we go to the same six agencies and why. You have the agency of record, you have the roster. And so how can you start thinking about who you're writing checks to and why and who else you can bring to the table so that they can bring a, new, a unique perspective and also really bring credibility to the project and really help understand how you can serve whatever community you wanna serve with authenticity and purpose. Thank you, Mita. Something that stuck with me when we were specifically talking about uh, products that are marketed towards black and brown folks is, who is the marketing agency behind that product? Are they also black and brown? And that's where, like you said, those messages get mixed up when somebody wants to release that product because those people like you weren't in the room or were the only person in the room that were expected to speak for the whole community. Yeah, and I would just add, JD, to that point is that when we see a racist piece of content blow up on Twitter, you start to think, okay, it was X brand, it was these marketers, and yes, they own blame, but it's entire ecosystem. When you're working at a lot of these companies, it's not just a team of three that did it. And that's actually where you're like, wow, this is systemic because so many people have had to have seen this before it went out into the world. And so to your point, it's not just about the people who are sitting in the company, it's the ecosystem. How can you ensure diversity of representation and all of the touch points from the moment that you sit around the table, ideate something, you're shooting something, who's behind the camera, who's in front of the camera, who's editing it, right? There's like so many, if you think about that journey, from when we finally see like a piece of content on YouTube, like what were all the, who were all the individuals involved in that? And I think that's what's important. I wanna just add something here real quick. I, I can't help myself. Um, something that I, I wanna just, um, I, I'm sure all of you out there um, listening, watching are, um, are hopefully sort of the, the, the what do they call it? The the lights are going on, if you will. The um, you know, Mita's example that she just shared. When we we talk about these four lenses of representation, there's always another question. There's always another lens to look at. Um, and you know, so when you think about a commercial, it's not just who the who the talent is in the commercial. It's who's who's in the team that envisioned the commercial, and it's. Who's, who is part of the group that created the products that this commercial is about and who's behind the camera and who wrote, who wrote the copy and the script. So, um, you know, I think that's just one of the things that we're gonna, and when you see the paper, hopefully that hopefully we did a good job with really illuminating this concept of there's always another lens. Um, and, you know, can, you can go to another higher, if you're using a magnifying glass, you can go to another magnification level to go to, an, to, to another, um, uh, a, a, another perspective, invite another voice, another, um, another lived experience into the conversation um, and uh, it can really be powerful to see how how that uh, can help evolve and influence the decision making thanks mina and thank you brian for adding that so now that we've talking about uh, your people your culture in the company um, the customers and how to interact with them Let's talk about community because you also need to interact with the community. You need to get back to that community. If you want your business to be sustainable, you need to build that sustainable pipeline. And that's through investing in that community that is around you. So um, I, would add, I would like to invite Bianca to the conversation because um, her and the team at Ericsson are doing some incredible work with something that we've seen pop up um, 
during the pandemic that we can no longer turn our eyes away. And that is kind of the tech divide that exists, particularly with underrepresented groups. And so I want to hear a little bit about what you and Ericsson are doing, because I think it's really fantastic. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. I will say it's it's very difficult to follow Mita and Brian when we're kind of talking about these different lenses, but I will do my best. And in a way, I feel like Mita kind of gave me a, a layup in terms of the, the pandemic, I think, shined a light on a, a lot of different um, maybe issues that maybe were under the surface and, and, and potentially we weren't as aware of. So it's not that the pandemic created the digital divide, but it really amplified that. And so what I've seen, um, even being newer to the tech industry and being in a diversity and inclusion role there is um, when we're talking about um, giving back to our communities, um, what I really see it as is an investment, right? And so I love the shift where um, companies are not simply thinking about diversity and inclusion or even corporate social responsibility as uh, well, how do we give to nonprofits that are doing great work? Like, how, uh, who do we make checks to, right? Um, there's certain, certainly a component of uh, a financial investment that goes a long way. But I think what's really unique about Ericsson is that we recognize we have passionate people and they have uh, very unique skills and expertise, specifically in tech. What we always, what we also recognize is there's this ongoing um Tape, I feel like I hear, and sometimes I think it's an excuse in terms of there's just not enough diversity in the pipeline. And so what a unique opportunity as we're thinking a lot about the digital divide um, that's been exacerbated by the pandemic um, and how not only do we address that in our local and global communities today, but how do we think about that long term, right? Um, the digital divide is not going to be solved overnight. Um, and it's very complex. Um, this was something I needed to learn about in my role because I'd spent many years in fashion. So I didn't really think about the digital divide in the way that I do today working for a tech company. And so um, you might think it's access to the internet, which that is one component. Um, you might think it's um, access to equipment. So access to a laptop, a Chromebook, something like that. Um, and then the third part I really think about is digital literacy. So um, when you think about the advantage that Mita's kids have in terms of Mita already knows how, how to use a computer, uh, she knows how to get to the internet. Um, I'm gonna assume it, it was fairly easy for her to get access to um, devices. Um, but when you think about potentially underrepresented or underserved communities, um, specifically communities of color, COVID really exacerbated those three issues when it comes to the digital divide. Potentially, they live in a community where there's not great Wi-Fi. Uh, potentially, the time it took for their school or different programs to help them get to the right device that they're going to need for online learning um, was slower than expected. And then the last piece is who's in the home or in their community that can help them get to school on their on their computer and and that's multifaceted and so um, certainly when you think about Ericsson there's a way that we can help in all those areas and in, in the short term but then also in the long term this is where we kind of talk about how it's not only good for our communities but it's good for humanity and it's good for business if we want more diverse um, talent in our pipeline short term and long term that means I have a vested interest in getting girls more interested in STEM and having them think it's fun. Um, that means there's um, an investment that makes sense for a company like ours to have um, communities of color who aren't traditionally um, represented in um, HBCUs or different colleges um, and seeing that number rise. And so if that's a summer camp, if that is mentorship, if that is scholarships in terms of thinking about the gaps that underrepresented and underserved communities face when it comes to education, specifically STEM education, how do we start to work with NGOs who are on the ground and doing this for a long time? And how do we work with those communities of color to come up with solutions? I think that's something that I'm also very mindful of in terms of um, when you think about corporations, traditionally some of the leadership at the top looks fairly homogenous. So, when you're talking about community, it's like, how do you ask the right questions? Who's at the table? Who feels like they can um, speak up? I feel like the conversation around um, 
a an ad that potentially is um, not approached with the correct lens doesn't get there um, quickly. There's a lot of people who touch it. And so in the same way, when you're doing community work, you want to make sure that as a corporation, you don't just come in and say, I see the problem and I think this is the solution without talking to a lot of different stakeholders in terms of, is this the right solution? Is it sustainable? Does it address the short-term and the long-term needs? Um, and is it something that the community agrees and, and is bought into in terms of that will drive sustainable change, right? Because I'm not about band-aids in terms of, let's just put a little band-aid on this and, and hopefully the issue will go away. So those are just some of my thoughts in terms of um, what we've approached um, in terms of looking at increasing the diversity pipeline in, in tech and kind of, in a way, um, using the pandemic as momentum to get things moving. Um, I think the other thing JD and I talked about is just um, my personal connection to the Asian community and um, a group that I am a part of, which is the Orchid Giving Circle. So even if you're not in a DNI practitioner role, what I would encourage people is if you're passionate about a certain community because you belong to it, because you're a strong ally to it, um, I'm a part of the Asian community and the Asian, the Orchid Giving Circle is Asian women who want to see more philanthropic funds to invested into the Asian community. And so um, we've been in existence for several years, but that's just something else personally that I'm using my time, I'm using my resources, I'm using my network to raise the awareness that, um, that there is a model minority myth and there are um, communities of um, Asian refugees or um, different groups that often are overlooked. And so how can the Asian community then raise awareness about that and change that, that status quo? So um, I'll, I'll pause there because I feel like I could go on and on when we talk about how we invest in our community. And, there, and I just would encourage you, there's different ways you can do it. You can do it through your company, but also personally, there's, I feel like a lot of opportunity to do that, um, especially with the perspective shift that we've had from COVID. I feel like people are looking a lot at how do I spend my time? What do I want my legacy to be? Um, and looking at that community lens is a key one where you can create a lasting impact. Thank you, uh, Bianca, for sharing all of that wonderful information. I especially love the part where you're saying, <clears throat> how do companies kind of help this tech divide that we have? Because I feel like a lot of the diversity and inclusion work um, focuses on once you get to the company, once you step foot into that room, but we don't look at the trajectory from K through 12 that somebody went through that is very different than one somebody else experienced. And so there's already a different starting point even when you get to the company. And so addressing that earlier on to build that sustainable pipeline is key and I, I'm so glad that Ericsson and others are starting these initiatives. So I know we've thrown a lot of information at you. So we wanna just give you some starter questions on you know, some things that you could take back to your company or even just think about. We have much more information in the leadership paper, but I just wanted to have uh, one for each lens so you start thinking about these things. So if we're thinking about people and recruitment and talent, does your company currently have partnerships with HBCUs, um, historically black colleges and universities? Uh, culture, does your company celebrate holidays from all religious backgrounds? This is something that we are seeing more and more, more awareness towards the Muslim community particularly during Ramadan because they fast. And so how do companies kind of work flexibly with these Muslim employees and take into consideration that they are fasting at this time and perhaps are not at 100% level because we all thrive on food to kind of fuel us. Um, customers, does your company have an accessible website for people with disabilities? We've seen data that is also in the paper that 71% of people with disabilities will just turn away from a website if it's not accessible. So 
just there, if we're talking about one in four Americans having a disability, and 71% of them turning away from your website, you are not reaching that population because of your web website accessibility. And lastly, community. Has your community pledged to fight racial injustice? Um, this is something that you'll also see the numbers say that Gen Z, 93% of them support the Black Lives Matter movement. So for the future, it's really important for your potential employees to um, see that you're doing something to solve these social inequities. And lastly, one point I really want to make sure is stress is that allyship is important, that you do not need to be specifically a part of this community in order to help, to amplify those voices, or to just show support by showing up. And I'd like to ask Jim to just share an experience in which he was asked to be part of a woman summit and he thought, I'm taking up space here because I'm a man but I want him to kind of talk about how he changed his perspective on that. So if we could help have Jim join us for a second. Hello. Hello, well, and while Jim is uh, joining us here, I just wanna uh, just add a, a, another piece of this puzzle here. Um, it was one of the things that we were talking about a lot at Hummingbird is, um, and I see there's a question in the chat that Jim, maybe we can ask you to answer as well um, from your from your perspective is, we know that we need straight white cisgender men to be part of the conversation. Um, and so I, we, Jim is one of the, the best champions and allies of someone who has that uh, identity as part of his lived experience that I know. So we said, Jim, we need you to be part of this paper uh, because your voice is important and we need others like you to join us on this journey. Um, so Jim, I'm so glad that you could be with us today. And uh, I know J JD loves this story. Uh, so we'll let you share that story. And then I know there's a question in the chat I'd love to see if you could help us with. Of course. Hi, it's been wonderful listening in and I, uh, appreciate you all asking me to participate. It's that simple question that we often talk about in inclusion is asking others to be a part of. And in 2014, I was asked by someone to be the MC of an event called the Women's Summit. And as an enterprise leader, I thought, oh, thanks, they're just asking me because this is a friend. And I said, you know, no, but here are six or seven strong women. It would be a great way to showcase their leadership and encourage them to step up to that role. I quickly got an email back from that friend and I won't say the word she said, but she basically said, hey, jerk face, but in a more explicit term, we want you. And there are 10 of us on the panel committee planning this and eight of us all identified you as a champion for us in our career. So if you don't do that, it's offensive to us. And that was the type of language I needed to hear to cut through the clutter. And it was during that time that that authentic voice of that friend saying, hey, you know, hey, we, we depended on you and now you're not stepping up. And something I shared with JD that was really instrumental for me is when I was preparing for that, um, it just so happens my, my partner, Emily, is a speech coach. And so, I was preparing for this big moment the next day and I couldn't figure out how I want to get started. And so she texts me, she's like, how's it going? I'm like, horribly. She's like, why? I'm like, I, I'm standing in this auditorium. I don't know where to begin. She's like, well, I'm in the building. She was coaching the CEO for an investor relations day. I'm like, why, why are you helping that person when I need your help today? So she's like, well, let me wrap up. And she came down and she convinced me to go sit in the auditorium. And instead of starting at the center stage, start where I originally was signed up to start as a participant. And the criticality of when leadership knocks on your door, do you answer it or not? And then I paid homage to the five most critical people, leaders in my career. And I asked everyone what they had in common. And I'm going to ask you. The five leaders who influenced my career the most were named Michelle, Heather, Trish, Stephanie, and Katarina. And I challenged everyone not to go with the simple thing, but the, the obvious, which is these were leaders who believed in talent and challenged people to be greater than what they were. 
And if I wasn't willing to step up, then I wasn't living into my commitment to them as advocates of mine. And so I ended up going to that leadership summit and being the MC because five leaders had encouraged me to always answer the door when leadership knocked. And that was a pivotal moment for me to start getting out of my own mind of what diversity and inclusion was all about and the importance of asking others to participate. And so it's a, it's a real full circle moment for me when JD and Brian reached out to me because simply asking me to participate is what it takes to get me active and to activate my power and my, my ability to spend the privilege I have representing the 17 most dominant privileges in the world to shape shift the cultures, to try to encourage and always hold myself accountable to asking others to participate. So that's why I'm here today. I am an advocate and a champion and a full believer in the power of simply asking someone to help. Jim, you, well, first of all, thank you. I love that story. Um, and that the, the, you may have already answered this question actually with what you just shared um, from the chat of, and I realize you can't speak for all straight white cisgender men, um, but um, the question is how do, how, there's, there's a question from someone who works in a tech company who has a leadership team that predominantly um, has that, that, that identity um, as the, you know, the, the leadership team all fit that, that, that identity profile and they're trying to get them involved. Um, so how, I mean, how did, how did you get involved? What, what was it, was it just someone asked you or were there things that started to trigger for you that, that things that crossed your emails, for example? Yeah. You know, I, I think it's, what ended up happening is the, the eight people of the planning committee said that they just were listening to me and they were observing my behavior. And it's one of those things where, you know, as, as a, an executive, you, you've always been told it's what you do more than what you say. And I think that's what I would encourage. So if you're in a tech company and you see an executive team that looks a lot more like me, find the individual who's talking differently than the rest of them and then set up the time. And if it, you know, I was always amazed people were hesitant. I would, in front of 5,000 people in the organization, I'd be like, if you want to speak to me, text me. Here's my mobile. <laughs> and time and time again, one or two people would be the only people who followed up. But, you know, listen to the leaders, listen to what they're saying. And as soon as you start to hear something that's a little bit different, feel free. The other piece, too, that we started doing within my former organization is, I'm going to add age as a privilege, you know, that, you know, it, it's seniority, but now things have changed a little bit, you know, because organizations are looking for younger views. And so there's, there's potential ageism that's happening. And so we started to understand, and I think Bianca, you're talking about digital literacy. Our executives were struggling with that. And so we started to pair the graduate students with our executives and, and they really started to collaborate and help each other understand in some spaces, DEI or environmental footprint, while the senior executives who tended to be more like me, uh, although I do have strong digital literacy, they started to learn how to use the social media platforms and things. So I always offer, it's important to bring a dish to the buffet. And, and as you're looking for that relationship, get over the idea that hierarchical mentoring is taking place, but it's peer mentoring. And that's the magic of what I've been experiencing. So listen for what's different and don't be afraid to offer your expertise because no, none of us are perfect. We all have areas of growth. So never be afraid to understand your superpower and how it can help engage someone who uh, remove their own kryptonite, if you will. As Thank a, you, Jim. And that's also something that is in our paper, which is reverse mentoring, which is really important and also has been shown to really be that symbiotic relationship with those uh, entry levels and those senior levels. So thank you for reminding us of that too. Um, I'd like to now hand it over to Brian with some stats of just why it's good for humans and good for business and kind of the future of what both your employees and customers want. Thanks, JD. The other thing I just want to comment on what I heard from, um, from your your message there, Jim, is um, I think, and, I, and I, I would say that I've been this person who has tried to like, let's get the whole team, the whole leadership team to be engaged. And I, and yes, I want them all to be engaged, but find one, 
<laughs> find one who is who who wants to see it differently and wants to maybe bring bring some different conversations to the table and then they can get the next person involved and and so on so i think that's a great way and it's it's possibly more realistic than the way we typically try to tackle those puzzles. Um, so, well, I, I know we only have about five minutes left. Uh, as JD mentioned, uh, we're going to share just a few more stats. Um, and I think uh, Bianca stole a little bit of our language earlier. Good, good for humanity. Good for business. That's okay. We're we're happy to share. You may borrow our language anytime, Bianca. Um, so let's um, let's share a few of these, and then I want to make sure we wrap up with. I'll, I have just a few few things I want to share, and then certainly I want to. Uh, offer some acknowledgements for everyone who's been involved. So 72% of full-time employees said they would leave an organization for one they thought was more inclusive. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, Mita said this earlier, we probably don't have to convince anyone on this call uh, that inclusion um, is good for business. Um, but I think, you know, there, there, what we, what we also know is these stats, while um, are, you know, they continue to be relevant, they've all, we've known this for a number of years. Uh, I think the, the first research around this 80s, 90s, we said, hey, diversity is good for business. And yet we're still, we're still fighting the fight. So um, we still have to continue to beat that drum. We have to find that person on the leadership team, as Jim mentioned, who will say, hey, we need to make sure this conversation is happening at, the, at that leadership table. Um, and hopefully those are individuals who will be on that team as well, who are from underrepresented uh, groups as well. 77% um, say companies must respond to racial injustice if they expect to earn or keep public trust. Uh, what we've what we've seen is the public sentiment um, and certainly the influence of the Generation Z population says, you know, companies uh, need to be responsible for the social impact they make on the world. And uh, that expectation is going to continue to increase, particularly as you know, JD mentioned earlier, as the, the identity of our population shifts over time, uh, those, uh, those expectations are going to shift over time as well. And the need for companies to be relevant to the marketplace are going to be shifting as well. Harvard, Harvard study found that customer satisfaction is tightly linked to company culture. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that this concept of representation matters and broadening or reframing representation matters happened uh, a few years ago when I was in house and I, I was in house as the head of DEI at Tapestry. And I got to see firsthand how the conversations that we were having at Tapestry to really to bring representation into our ecosystem, into our benefits, into our marketing and advertising, into our into our products, into our talent pipelines, into our uh, in our culture, um, you know. Every aspect of the company had inclusion infused in some way, and that was partly driven by our CEO's commitment to inclusion, and also because we said that inclusion was one of our three values at Tapestry, inclusion, innovation, and optimism. So in, for it to work, it really does have to be part of the entire ecosystem. And 93% of employees who volunteer through their company report being happy with their employer. Give your employees the opportunity to be engaged in doing good. Uh, yes, they're there for whatever their job may be, and they're there because they want to be part of a community. They want to be part of a community that is uh, is creating a product or service. And also, you know, you can give them the opportunity to be part of something that's that's bigger than them and bigger than the company itself. So I want to make sure. So first of all, as you can tell, I love this concept. Um, I'm I'm really excited for for us to share this paper, and hopefully, it will impact hearts and minds. That's our that's our goal. When we um, when you get to see the paper, what you'll see is um, what you experience today. That the paper will go back and will share both stories from real humans, uh, Bianca, Nita, and Jim's stories are included in there, as well as uh, Ben Green and Bryce uh, Salado and uh, Shandana, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Sanjana. Um, and I'm really, I'm really delighted that we are able to share the stories of real humans and their real experiences. And then it's balanced with stats because the reality is 
uh, we are as much as this this work and this commitment is the right thing to do. Uh, we our companies and organizations need to make good business decisions, and uh, and so the the stats will help to reinforce why those why these decisions are important, and why this work is important, and how it can make an impact on the company. So I know we're at one. At the, I would just want to wrap up and say thank you. Um, thank you to Mita and Bianca and Jim for being part of our panel today. JD, thank you for your work on this paper. Um, really, really fantastic work. Um, and Sanjana and Bryce and Ben, thank you for sharing your voices. I also want to acknowledge the a new partner for Hummingbird Humanity, uh, Prideful Hearts, um, which is an LGBTQ plus uh, owned um, creative agency. They did all of the work on the paper. So Elizabeth, Abe and Malcolm, congrats. And thank you so much. You um, made this paper something that I never expected it could be. Um, and so grateful to have your talents and passion as part of the project. And uh, Julia, who was our project manager on the, pro the product, uh, project as well, um, she um, helped to make sure that we hit all of our deadlines, which uh, given that I continue to have lots of new ideas is, um, in the midst of the project is a little bit of a challenge. So, um, so thanks, Julia. So everyone, uh, stay tuned. You'll get the paper in your inboxes this afternoon. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, representation matters um, and share your stories, uh, share the paper with others. And uh, thank you for being with us today. Happy Tuesday. Happy Pride. Be safe. Bye, everyone.